Thank you so much, Sterling, for that introduction. It's such an honor to be here today to speak with you. Um, I'll be providing an overview of dysphagia or swallowing dysfunction in persons with Alzheimer's disease, and I thought I should start just with my disclosures, both financial and non-financial. So just to start, I'd like you all to just take a few minutes here to reflect on the last week or two weeks of your lives. And just to think a little bit about the activities that you partake in, how many of those activities involve eating and drinking. Socially, even just at home with your family at the end of the day, that's your time to really connect with your kids and your spouse. So we all swallow 600 to 1,000 times a day without even thinking about it. It's not something that's really on our, on our minds as we do this all day long. So now I'd like you to imagine that every time you swallow, the food gets stuck in your throat. You can't get it down. You have to run to the bathroom to spit it out. How that would feel in your everyday life and how that would impact the way that you interact with others and just your general quality of life. So we know that dysphagia or swallowing dysfunction has a very profound impact on quality of life for our patients. So my learning objectives today first are to describe dysphagia and its impact on overall health in individuals with Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. I'll summarize our current approaches to swallowing evaluation and treatment in this population. And then I'll discuss the need for a much needed paradigm shift in dysphagia management with a focus on the po this population. So I'd like you to take a good look at this slide because at the end of my talk, I'll have a quiz for you. Um, but no, the purpose of this slide is just to emphasize how complex the swallowing process is. It involves precise coordination of 50 muscle pairs and six cranial nerves. And even with that level of coordination, we perform it in less than a second. As a clinical speech language pathologist, when I'm evaluating dys for dysphagia, looking to identify dysphagia in my patients, the most commonly used evaluation procedure is our video fluoroscopic swallow study, which is essentially a moving x-ray that allows us to look at how material moves through the mouth and the throat. So here you can see a lateral image of an individual's mouth and throat. The dark material is barium. It's radio opaque, opaque so that we can see it on the x-ray. So one of the things that we're looking for in our evaluation is for the safety of the swallow. So we want to know whether or not food or liquid enters the airway. On the left, in the red circle, you'll see a small amount of this dark material in the top of the airway, or the laryngeal vestibule. We call this penetration. And on the right, you'll see that that same material has now moved down below the vocal folds into the trachea or the windpipe, and this we call aspiration. If an individual has a lot of aspiration over time, they can develop infectious processes like pneumonia. The other thing that we're concerned about in our evaluation is for the efficiency of the swallow. So we call material left over in the mouth and throat residue. And the reason we're concerned about this is because after you swallow, you have to take a breath. And when you go to breathe, some of that material is at risk for moving into your airway. So here is a, a video fluoroscopic swallow study image of a young, healthy adult. And what I'd like you to notice is how quickly the material moves through the mouth and throat and into the esophagus, which is indicated with the red arrow. There's really no material left over after the swallow. In contrast, this is the swallow of an 82-year-old female post-stroke with post-stroke dysphagia. And again, if you look inside the red circle, you'll see that some of that same material is moving down towards the airway and being aspirated. It's important to understand that dysphagia is not in and of itself a disease. It's the result of a whole host of disease processes. So for the remainder of the talk, I'll be focusing on one of these diseases, and that's Alzheimer's disease and related dementias that commonly results in the occurrence of dysphagia. The prevalence of comorbid dysphagia in individuals with Alzheimer's disease is highly variable, as you can see, between 32 and 75%. And the reason for this is the way that dysphagia is evaluated. So if dysphagia is identified clinically, it will have a different prevalence than if we're actually looking at um, the swallowing under x-ray. 
But we do know that approximately 50% of all individuals with dementia will lose the ability to feed themselves within eight years post-diagnosis. Here at UWHC, we performed a chart abstraction review in the year 2014 of all consults for swallow evaluation to our swallowing service. And we found that 307 of these patients had a diagnosis of dementia. Of those, 50% received a video fluoroscopic swallow study. And when their swallowing was evaluated, 75% of them were found to have some level of dysphagia. And we do actually have a poster here today um, highlighting these results. So why should we care about dysphagia in individuals with dementia? Well, we know that bronchopneumonia is the most common cause of death in Alzheimer's disease, and dysphagia has been shown to be an independent predictor for both aspiration and non-aspiration pneumonia in adults over 70 years of age. Malnutrition occurs in over 50% of long-term care residents, and dysphagia, again, is a big contributor to that. In a study comparing individuals with dementia who had comorbid dysphagia with those who did not, when looking at discharge, they found that those individuals with dysphagia were at increased risk for pneumonia, malnutrition, feeding tube placement, had a longer length of hospital stay, and were more likely to be discharged to a facility. So I just pulled this image off of Google just to highlight sort of the current state of understanding in the broader field of geriatrics when it comes to dysphagia in where it fits in in the dementia process. So this is just highlighting some of the common sequela that we would observe with dementia progression. And I'd like you to notice that dysphagia is placed in the terminal stages of the disease process. So the current understanding or thought process is that this is really not something that we can impact because it's just expected at end of life. But thanks to some more recent studies using neuroimaging and also biomechanical analysis of our swallow studies that you saw today, we now understand that these changes in swallowing actually begin early in the disease process and worsen as dementia progresses. I've already talked with you a little bit about some of the swallowing impairments that these individuals can have. They can also have issues with self-feeding. So sometimes there are problems even recognizing that food is food and that's something that should be eaten. Actually getting the material from the plate to the mouth in the right amounts and at the right pace. So when we're evaluating in this population, we're not only thinking about swallowing, getting the food through the mouth and throat, but also how the individual is feeding themselves. We know that swallowing impairments do vary by dementia subtype. So here you can see on the left, in the Alzheimer's disease population, you're more likely to observe oral phase impairments, meaning it's more difficult to get material out of the mouth and into the throat. Whereas in individuals with vascular dementia, we're more likely to see what we call pharyngeal phase impairments. So these are issues moving the material through the throat without having it enter the airway. There are a variety of causes of swallowing impairment in this population. One of the primary causes is a reduction in the strength of the musculature that we use for swallowing. So just like the other muscles in our bodies and our limbs, the ball bar innervated muscles of the head and neck are vulnerable to the effects of advancing age. So the sarcopenic process, changes in muscle mass and quality, will affect, affect the muscles that we use for swallowing as well. We also know that individuals with Alzheimer's disease experience a decrease in their taste sensation and olfaction, which can affect the ability to manage material correctly in the mouth while swallowing and can also affect appetite. Due to the neurodegenerative processes in the brain, we know that some of the areas involved in the swallowing network receive input from the insula, which is atrophied in early Alzheimer's disease and is very important for swallowing planning and initiation. We also know that individuals who have cognitive impairment, so um, issues with orientation and following commands, are at higher risk for having issues with safety during their swallow, so at higher aspiration risk. 
And then finally, we know that individuals with Alzheimer's disease produce less saliva overall than age match controls. And that's important because saliva helps to maintain oral health. So these individuals have issues with dentition that is sort of effective for having efficient mastication or chewing. And then it also impacts the bacterial colonization in the mouth. We know that having a dysbiotic oral bacterial environment predisposes individuals to pneumonia development. So based on some of these factors, we've developed our own conceptual model of dysphagia and Alzheimer's disease. Here you can see some of those mechanistic factors that I've described that contribute to the swallowing outcomes of interest clinically, that then can predispose individuals to these negative health outcomes. We also know that there are other contributing factors that either on their own or in combination with dysphagia can also lead to the negative health outcomes. So what's our current approach to dysphagia management? Well, as a speech-language pathologist on the inpatient service, I'm often seeing these individuals for the first time when they're admitted to the hospital, maybe for an unrelated issue like a UTI or even for aspiration pneumonia. Most of the time, I haven't been included as part of their interdisciplinary team, so I don't really have an idea of their diagnostic process, their dementia subtype, or where they're at in their disease stage. As an inpatient, many of our patients have the overlay of delirium, so it can be difficult for us to have a good idea of what their baseline swallowing function looks like. And it can be challenging to connect with caregivers and family members while they're admitted to the hospital. So ultimately, we end up recommending that they have a video fluoroscopic swallow study, which you've already seen, and then we typically recommend what we call compensatory approaches. And many of you, if you've have to, had a loved one in the hospital, may have seen that our recommendations include thickened liquids or pureed foods, a change in the posture of the head. These are all recommendations that will improve the safety of the swallow, but they will not change the underlying physiology or biomechanics. As part of our chart abstraction project, for those individuals with dementia and comorbid dysphagia, we looked at what the most typical recommendations were at our hospital. And we found that the majority of individuals were recommended one of these compensatory approaches, a diet change, a feeding strategy, or a postural adjustment. Less than 2% were recommended a rehabilitative approach that involved exercise. And so today I'm proposing a paradigm shift in our current dysphagia management approach. Moving from our reactive approaches that are compensatory with the goal of conserving energy and improving swallowing safety and efficiency during meals, and typically these are only being enacted after dysphagia has been identified, moving from these reactive approaches to more proactive approaches that target underlying physiologic function early before the development of dysphagia so that we can maintain and optimize quality of life longer into disease progression. So here you can see the sort of typical trajectory of decline in swallowing functional reserve as individuals age in the blue line. In contrast, in the green line, when we have a neurodegenerative process like dementia, that trajectory is steeper and quicker. If we were to enact some of these positive influences like early diagnosis, interdisciplinary care, and proactive dysphagia management, our goal would be to move that green line closer to the sort of typical trajectory for aging. And to that end, I have some funding from the National Institute on Aging in the form of a K-23 award, clinical trial design. And we have the goal of recruiting 120 patients with Alzheimer's disease or related dementias and comorbid dysphagia. An individual is identified as being dysphagic, dysphagic using that video fluoroscopic swallow study. We then have a baseline assessment. And if they have dysphagia, they are then randomized into one of four groups. One of our interventions involves strengthening the tongue systematically over eight weeks. Here you can see the blue bulb in the mouth on the tongue, and the individual presses that against the roof of their mouth, and we, it's an intensive progressive treatment. 
And the other intervention is regular application of a gel saliva substitute that's designed to mimic saliva, increase lubrication, and also help to maintain oral health. So our individuals can be randomized to each of these interventions individually, a combination, or usual care. We have an eight-week follow-up point, and then we have 90-day post-enrollment medical record review. And as a REC scholar, I have the honor of having additional funding to collect oral microbiome samples throughout this trial so that we can also look at the relationship of the oral microenvironment to pneumonia risk in our cohort. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge my mentors and collaborators, the Swallowing and Salivary Bioscience Lab, the two clinical services at the UW and VA that support my work, and I'm happy to address any questions that you might have. We have some microphones uh, around the room, so if you have a question, can you please raise your hand and we will run you a microphone. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that you have identified the occurrence of dysphagia early in the mild stages of the disease. Has anybody or your group looked even earlier in the disease continuum where maybe an individual who is still independent, perhaps in the MCI stages of the disease, do they have any kind of dysphagia? And the second part of my question, if they do, is this something that can have a diagnostic value in terms of identifying patients who potentially are destined to have Alzheimer's disease? Thank you so much for your question. So if I understand the question is whether there have been any has been any research looking into identification of dysphagia earlier in the disease process, so MC, preclinical MCI phases. And the answer to that is no, there, there has not been any work um, that early. Um, all of the work I was referring to was at with a mild uh, dementia diagnosis. Um, I think it's very important that we start to look earlier. Um, some of the changes that we see in the mild phase Phases would be considered subclinical. So we do see changes in biomechanics and neural innervation for swallowing, but it's not always manifesting in the clinical outcomes of aspiration and residue. Um, however, there are rehabilitative approaches that we can use to build functional reserve for swallowing with the goal of sort of preventing or pushing off onset of dysphagia. So I do think it's an important direction. Yeah. 